Okay, so the ISI is a combination of a psychological and sociological measure of distress, psychological distress and sociological distress. And the anxiety and depression component measure the psychophysiological response to both psychological internal stimuli and stressors and social external uh, stressors, which are external and coercive. Um, so we, we respond to both. Uh, and as a consequence of that, um, you can look at these other dimensions below it relaxed, inhibited, regulated, and they describe the dimensions of our social interaction, the way we interact socially with people. Now, where do these dimensions come from? They come from this vast body of sociological and psychological literature that's out there. And I taught both at the university level and I taught graduate and undergraduate, both research methods and psychology and sociology. So I had my head stuck on this stuff for a long time. And I was able to review the literature at a, at a vast level, you know, look at it, and then choose what I thought were the most robust dimensions with the best face validity. Face validity means does it look like it's actually, you know, going to measure what you think it's going to measure. Um, and so you're, these come from other authors. And uh, so all of these dimensions uh, measure social behavior. Now, there are um, 16 dimensions here. Um, and they are opponent process dimensions. They are complementary, not in the way that you think, but regulated and impulsive um, are complementary. Passivity and assertiveness are complementary. Uh, relaxed and inhibited are complementary. Uh, flexible and perfectionistic are complementary. Sometimes it's mysterious to people how you, this, these can be independent dimensions, but they are in fact, and we've run the stats, and I'll show you the stats just today only, special deal, because uh, I don't want to bore you with that. I know most of you are not particularly interested in that side of things. But um, each of these dimensions measures a dimension of social behavior that's been measured by other researchers, and they've used um, other instruments to measure them. And some of the items in each of these dimensions were inspired by that other research. In other words, we looked at the face validity of the questions, the items for each dimension. And a dimension is composed of five or six questions that tap into aspects of that dimension. So if we were looking at inhibited, you would have five or six questions that tapped into the dimension of inhibited. Okay, that's the construct, that's the dimension, inhibited. So I don't feel comfortable when I'm around other people because I'm anxious. What questions would you ask them? So we look at the face validity of other researchers over the decades who looked at that, and we look at their questions, and then we construct questions along those lines because we know they've been validated previously in peer-reviewed journals and statistically validated. So we know they've got good face validity. And then we put these each, we have, so we have a constructor dimension with those items. And so we have these 16 um, dimensions that um, are complementary. And the overarching uh, concept that bind all these together is uh, avoidant and interactive. Interactive is approach behavior based in left hemisphere activation. And avoidant is right hemisphere based. And it's okay, so too much activity in the right hemisphere makes you avoidant, makes you pull back. That is consistent with 30 years of research on uh, asymmetry and affect, and uh, starting with Richard Davidson in the 80s. So you have this long history showing us that with the EEG, we can measure whether people have a primarily uh, interactive or approach. Uh, uh, behavior pattern or a withdrawal or avoidant behavior pattern. And the approach behavior patterns are the positive ones here. So relaxed, regulated, um, assertive, okay, cooperative, independent. Those are approach 
social related behaviors. People who are engaged and approach social behaviors, they have adequate amounts of, of, of serotonin and dopamine and acetylcholine, and they aren't overly driven by norepinephrine and deficits of serotonin and dopamine. Uh, so there's even a uh, neurochemical profile that corresponds to this opponent process. And our protocols are based upon that opponent process theory, which has its basis in um, the ascending uh, vagal and splanchic systems and the ascending system in the brain. So this is all of a piece. The whole database system is based around these concepts. And uh, they have grown more supported over the decades as we've watched. I remember presenting this um, particular instrument 15 years ago, I think it was, at uh, AAPB. And I got a pretty good room of people interested in the concept. But most of them just, uh, they were blank stares and confusion uh, because they hadn't really read the same literature and it was such a big topic. I don't think I was adequately able to explain it to everybody. Um, but I think uh, at this point, people are, are understanding it better, and I'm explaining it better. Um, so if we take a group of people who are doing well in life, you know, and we measure them, and they're not anxious, they're not depressed, um, they're, uh, they're focusing well, they're remembering well, they don't have any severe history of head injury, um, life is good, they have good marriages. These are the people that we call peak performers. We took a profile of these top performers from sports, from business, okay, and um, from training, corporate trainers. And we took these people and we looked at a group of them and we said, uh, what's the norm for these people? And so we did an average, we assessed all of them and how does that work? Well, each dimension has these five or six, sometimes more, eight questions with Likert-like scales on a scale of one to five. What do you think of this or that? And um, then we get a score for each dimension. So we measured how they scored on average in each of these dimensions. And they are in purple. Okay. And then the red line here just shows you the statistical mean or uh, midpoint for all the scales. Because when we developed this, you know, we didn't expect the peak performers to all meet the, the midline. That wouldn't make sense. They have a unique profile, and that's what we wanted to capture. So you can see that successful people are highly relaxed. They are not very inhibited. The purple's low. They're very regulated. Uh, they're uh, not very impulsive, but somewhat impulsive. They're, they're not particularly passive. They're very assertive. They're very flexible. They're a little bit perfectionistic. Need a little extra oomph in there. Um, they're very cooperative. Uh, they are somewhat competitive, but they are not that competitive. Most of the people who are successful, uh, if you read um, uh, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman and his comprehensive um, research and assessment of corporate performance and corporate uh, behavior, you'll find that the best performers in business and anywhere, even in the military, you would find the same thing, are people who have high emotional intelligence. Now, what does that mean? Well, Goleman defines emotional intelligence very specifically, and he wrote a wonderful book called Primal Leadership, which explains how this would appear and does appear in top business performers. And it's been one of the major paradigms of business peak performance since um, I think Goldman did that in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, yeah, if I can, if I could chime in, Richard, with yeah. a quick example from that book, he gave the, uh, an excellent example of a young man who graduated honors, like major honors, top of his class in business from Harvard and couldn't get a job. Yeah. Couldn't get a job and keep it. And that's because while he had incredibly high IQ, he had incredibly low EQ, emotional intelligence. Very good. I think that, Absolutely. That's a, that's a good it's demonstration a for the point you're making. Yeah. And that, it's, that, uh, that, that athletic performers are the same as I would think that very competitive. 
No, they're a little bit different. Uh, each group is a little bit different, but when you average them together, you know, which is what we did, um, you get a general profile of what those people look like. And they're not that different. They are different, but they're not that different in general. N not as much as you'd think. Um, because they're all working on teams. And they all have to have emotional intelligence, and they all have to work together to be successful. And, and that's the key for success in our society. It's emotional intelligence. It's, it's not being smart. It's not being a genius. That doesn't always work. It's how, long, how well can you read other people? Can you be empathic? Can you work with them? Can you listen? Can you cooperate? Can you compromise? These are the skills of peak performers. But those are the skills that go out the window, by the way, when you're um, having mental disorder. Those are the ones that degrade, and you experience in your life a huge amount of friction. Now, I explain all of this in detail with citations in the literature review on my publication on the ISI, and I'll show you that in a minute. But um, that's the critical part. For me, we're talking about friction, social friction, being able to get your needs met, know how to interact with other people, to get your needs met so you can thrive. And if you don't know, you get corresponding friction, and that produces psychophysiological anxiety and then ultimately depression, just how Martin was talking about the other day, um, if you were there for that. And um, uh, I wrote a book called Automatic Self, which goes into this in pretty thorough detail for the general public, um, and you can find that there. So a lot of these ideas... Uh, are floating around new mind and I know Rob ha shares a lot of these similar ideas too because we've been working with people for so long clinically and with neurofeedback you start to see this inevitably the thing is to organize it in a way that's useful so here we have you know these different dimensions and actually you can tell pretty clearly somebody who's fairly healthy versus somebody who's got some serious problems and of course, the big tip-off is anxiety and depression. That's number one. They've got a psychological issue. But number two, we can be more specific as to why that psychological issue exists. And we can even predict uh, what their EEG asymmetry is going to look like. So if you look at your um, um, map dashboard and you look at the, the areas for over-arousal, under-arousal, you'll see that there is a a number at the top, a red number, giving you the ISI score. And you'll see most of the time people who are depressed match the ISI measure of depression, and people who are anxious max, match the ISI measure of anxious. And then you can come back from looking at their map and the asymmetry, the EEG asymmetry, and look and see why, what social dimensions, what behaviors are driving this. Now we have probably 60, 100,000 of these things now, and I haven't had a chance to run the stats on those on those levels. We will be doing that next year, but I've run the stats on a lot of it. So um, that's uh, important to keep your your your, uh, your thoughts on. Now, just a second, I have to um, mute somebody who didn't mute themselves. There we go. Uh, that's one person. Okay, there's New Jersey. Okay, so given that's the case, this is very valuable because if you're looking at a map and you see somebody's got a metabolic score of, you know, 150, 200, which is getting into a very serious level on the physiological measures, you can go and see, is this coming from something that's purely physical? Were they in a car accident, exposed to a toxin, uh, a, a medication response? Or is this related to um, their social psycho psychological profile? You go to the ISI and it says, okay, they're depressed or anxious because of their social profile, because it's off. You can tell and look and see how much it's off in the ISI by looking at uh, how much these mismatch in a negative direction. And that's very valuable. And you can tell specific things about them because the ACE study tells us that, um, that socialization you know, is a process which when it involves a lot of distress, psychological and social distress, that socialization process 
results in adults with an inordinately high level of mental and physical disorders. It's clear as a bell now. We know that for a fact. Um, and this tells you what was their trajectory. So you see something like this and I say, okay, um, we have a psychologist who has been using this to look at pilots to see um, what pilots who are doing well look like versus pilots who aren't doing well. And I presented this in the peak performance presentation, which I think is posted at this point uh, on the YouTube channel. But if you look at this, you can see, well, this person is a little high on impulsivity right there in the middle. And that impulsivity uh, is the thing that's most out in this whole profile, really. Uh, so that's something that he could work on is reducing impulsivity. And we might want to look at that and why that's the case. I suspect that he's more anxious than he's reporting and he's under reporting. So we will be putting a lie scale into the ISI in the next year. So you can capture people who are under reporting or over reporting as the case may be. But notice here, we've got a, a fair match to the um, purple compared to this one. Um, this next one I'm going to show you is a pilot who's not doing so well. Oh. There's the good pilot. And there's the pilot not doing so well. Can you see how much higher the anxiety and depression are elevated, right? Back the depression's up at a clinical level. Inhibited is quite high. Where's the inhibited for the pilot doing well? Inhibited for the pilot doing well? Look, it's down there where it naturally is. How about regulated? Um, this pilot is highly regulated. That means he really lines his ducks up in a row and he knows how to take care of them. Uh, and that one is right here, he's doing well, he's about normal. If we go to the abnormal pilot, he's actually overregulated. Let's look at impulsivity. Well, they're both high on impulsivity there and there. That's something they have in common. Passivity. Well, that's up pretty pretty high in the good good pilot, and it's up high in that. What's passivity about? So, you know, in short terms, passivity is about conflict avoidance. So people who are passive avoid conflict. Well, you want pilots to avoid conflict and be cooperative. So not maybe a bad thing to have. Now, if this passivity gets too high, well, then we've got a much more serious problem. Um, inhibited, um, when it's high, inhibited, are you comfortable around people you don't know? It's a really good measure of social comfort, soci sociophobia, which is usually high in people with any kind of disorder. Um, if we look at assertiveness, okay, troubled pilot looks pretty good there. The regular pilot, so pilots are pretty assertive. Um, how about flexible? This pilot's very flexible, troubled pilot. Um, right on the button with the other pilot, Perfectionism in the pilot that's doing well is pretty close to the purple line. Perfectionism is quite elevated in the troubled pilot. So perfectionism usually comes from people trying to control their environment to make themselves feel safe. People who have a higher level of anxiety from, from chronic social distress, okay, they feel that their world is unpredictable. And we talked about that in the last Lunch and Learns, um, that you know, if you lose um, a parent when you're 10 years old, um, the world doesn't seem very predictable. If you're if you're beaten as a child, the world does not look very predictable and safe. So you take extraordinary measures to try to make sure everything's correct. That's the perfectionism. It usually doesn't work out. Um, cooperative is very high in this a troubled pilot. The good pilot cooperativeness is just average. Okay, independence. Um, well, the good pilot is uh, not that independent. Yeah, yeah. Richard, you kind of skipped from, you, uh, you go back to cooperative. You went from cooperative to competitive, and you kind of skipped competitive. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Just catching you on it. <laughs> okay. So here's competitive for the trouble pilot. Notice competitive is quite high. He's very competitive. And the, um, um, the pilot that's doing well is not that competitive. Now, you're going to see that pattern a lot in people 
what we found, people with disorder um, have high competitive and perfectionism, and it correlates highly with depression. It's about a 90% correlation. It might even be higher. We're going to run the bigger numbers soon on all of these factors. But we found that the people who were perfectionistic and competitive were very high on self-derogation. They're very highly self-critical. Okay, They did not believe it in their heart that they had a lot of worth and that they had a lot of control over their environment. Okay, So their, their sense of control was external okay, rather than internal. This is a, a dominant theoretical paradigm in psychology. Where's your, where's your uh, perception of control? And um, people with disorder often feel victimized in that the power is not within them but always outside them. And when that happens, they tend to look to others to um, lead them in, in, in where to go. And so, you know, they have slightly higher levels of dependence. Um, and it's, it's a little bit elevated in this pilot. That could be important to be a little bit dependent on what others are looking at. And it's a little elevated in this pilot. So it's not that elevated. When it gets really elevated in dependence, what you're going to find is that these people are highly codependent people. They grew up in families that are rigidly disengaged where there was either a, a somebody who was chronically ill or gambling all the time or severe financial issues constantly or they were addicts, alcoholics. These people always show really high dependence levels just through the roof. So not too bad here, just a little elevated. Maybe something you'd like in a pilot. Um, the pilot that uh, is well adjusted and doing well is his interactive, he likes people. Interactive means he likes people. And avoidant means that, uh, you know, you stay away from people. But no, he doesn't avoid people and he likes people. Let's look at the pilot who's troubled. The troubled pilot is low on interactive. He really doesn't want to get with people. And, and not only that, but he actively goes out of his way to avoid people. So Richard Martin, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, you know pilots. You know that's my thing. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> a quick question: uh, These two pilots, are you uh, are you familiar with their background? Are they airline pilots or Army Air Force pilots? They're because airline that's a pilots. Huge difference. They're, airline pilots. They're Both. airline okay. pilots. Yeah. Okay. Thank but, you. But the uh, and the, although there's a difference, the research says that they have a lot in common, and uh, and we can talk about that some other time. We could do a special thing on peak performance in pilots because I have a whole presentation I've done on that in the past but the main reason I use pilots is because they're team players and they have to be uh, highly disciplined they have to have really high emotional intelligence to really do the job to be a captain requires a, a really important profile and this is one of the ways of getting at it but you can see it in business and sports the same thing absolutely um, all the time um, Richard yeah so regulated what, how are you defining that exactly? What you're looking at? Regulated is um, uh, re regulated is people who know how to organize themselves and take care of themselves. People who are who are good at their activities of daily living, who have a routine, and who um, uh, know how to line up their docks and get things done. All right, so I'm going to escape this and go to something else. So real quick, uh, those should help. We're going to do another write-up on this, um, and we'll be adding, we'll be adding a, a, the reports will be more personally profiled based on what we've learned of this, but we want to run the statistics early next year for all of it before we um, embed it in the report system. At the moment, the report system is very generic. It just tells you what each dimension is about, but it can be very confusing. And so I think it's good to just give you the bottom line in this presentation of, of what you're looking for with each dimension. Uh, here's the paper you can find. The paper is published and posted on the uh, New Mind Maps. If you go up to the help section, on the validity and reliability area, you will find uh, where we publish the validity and reliability measures and the uh, research behind the ISI. So this is not a casual uh, 
instrument by any means. Uh, and so here you'll see um, that we're talking about these concepts of approach and avoidance and social accuracy and how um, they affect people. And, you know, we pull from uh, sociology, Durkheim, Skinner, psychology, Mead, sociology. We look at Gestalt theory. Um, we're really pulling together common findings in uh, all of these uh, areas, um, perseverance, effect, self-fulfilling prophecy. These are all important concepts that are embedded in these measures that we're looking at. Um, and you can read about them if you're interested in the theory behind the ISI and how we came up with each with each thing and how I originally uh, presented this in, uh, I think, uh, 2000, somewhere around there, 2001, we did a presentation at ISNR. Uh, we had like 80 people at that presentation on QEG. Um, and we showed there, I showed, okay, I'd done the ISI, and I said, now I'm beginning to see correlations between ISI and, uh, and, and behavior and QEG and behavior. So the presentation is on QEG and behavior. And we're looking at those relationships there. Uh, once we did that, it was not hard to uh, start making more connections. So here we talk about uh, if people are dependent, if they're competitive, if they're perfectionistic, each dimension is described. Each domain is described, and that's what you need to do with an instrument. And then we look at the subjects. So um, to set up the ISI as you're now using it, we used an N of 3,000, which is a very good N size for uh, uh, the type of statistical measures we were using. But in general, these 3,000 people came from hundreds of clinics across the United States. So we know it's a very good sample. And it's uh, probably one of the better samples I've seen on this kind of work. Uh, subjects were uh, males and females, 16 to 92 years of age. And um, we have 136 items that define two meta dimensions. 14 dimensions um, were, were approach and avoidance dimensions, uh, which are social psychological. And then we have the anxiety and depression. Okay. And then what you do when you do an instrument, you evaluate them for validity uh, and reliability. So you generate a scale. And uh, then you run, and I won't get into this too much, but you run um, uh, principal components analysis. So we talked here a bit a little bit about uh, um, the correlation matrix and whether whether it was a valid matrix and it looked like it was working right. Then we talked about orthogonality statistically. Were these things separating out when you ran them statistically? So when you do an instrument like this, what you're trying to do is see, do the items in each dimension, when you run them, correlate them, do they naturally fall into those dimensional groups or do they cross dimensions? Well, we found that uh, they had very high levels of kind of uh, coagulating, you know, coalescing together. And that means that these dimensions were very real. The way people answered them, statistically, they tended to group together. And then we talk about, you know, why we use Veramax rotation and eigenvalues and all of that stuff, which most people are not interested in. Then you run on each one, you run what's called Kronbach's alpha, and you look at do these items in each, the items in each dimension self-correlate within that dimension very strongly? So you double check, you know, yeah, they coagulated and they separated out into these groups, but as a group, how well do they correlate together? How strong is that dimension? And these are the strengths of those dimensions when you look at these alphas. These are very, very good alphas. You don't run into alphas like this very often. But that's because I spent decades pulling together the items and the concepts and, and, and checking the face validity of them. So we have very strong alphas. So you're getting very accurate measures. And that's why I have such confidence when I do this instrument and I look at it, you can have confidence that you're really measuring what you think you're measuring and you can measure it reliably and consistently. And if you keep giving them that same instrument, uh, they'll keep giving you the same basic pattern unless something in them changes. So there's that. So you can uh, check all that out. Uh, we don't need to get into that anymore. <laughs>
and look at um, you can check all that out and and uh, uh, that should help give you confidence about what you're doing and why you're using it. So remember, the ISI is a way of seeing how much of the distress in their map is a consequence, how much of their distress is a consequence of the psychological dimension and the social dimension. And as you know, we're always trying to figure that out. They have a high metabolic um, score, their map looks bad, they're ox they've got, you know, really high levels of oxidative stress, lots of slowed alpha, theta, maybe delta, diffuse delta. And we want to know, you know, what's going on. I get, a, I get a fast oxidizer, a slow oxidizer, and these are what their maps generally look like. And we know that because we've run statistics on that. And we will publish this study eventually on my journals. But uh, we're up to 90 people so far, and our samples are holding. The correlation between hair analysis and QEG is very good, and between uh, fast oxidizers and fast frequencies and slow oxidizers and slow frequency maps, very strong, very strong there. They are different groups. So we get a, a, an oxidizer that's a slow oxidizer, and we say, wow. Is this because, you know, they have a thyroid problem or is this because they have um, a really bad childhood or is this because, you know, they, they were in war and traumatized or in a horrific car accident or something? You can go to the ISI and look and say, how many variables, you know, how off is this ISI? How much anxiety and depression they have? And do they have a lot of strong social measures which show that they have the pattern of somebody who was, um, uh, you know, pretty distressed as they grew, and their brain grew into a pretty distressed brain, and they grew a pretty distressed body. And so that's why it's such a great instrument to use in contrast. You can use the computerized performance test, look at their cognitive function, but you can look at the ISI and look at their social functionality and the anxiety depression gives you a sense of the psychological issues underlying that um, important measures to know when you're when you're doing a map uh, the anxiety and depression measures in the ISI um, uh, how good are they we we did a, um, a study of covariance between um, the uh, ISI and the Beck inventories, which are one of the standard measures in psychology, to see them, to check that out. And we found the covariance was quite high, very high. And um, and if you look here, you can see the ISI is in red and the Beck inventories in blue. Now, the reason the values are higher, the scores are higher in the ISI because it has more items than the Beck inventory. And because each dimension has more items, it's more sensitive. Because of that, we've actually found from the uh, uh, ISI uh, anxiety and depression measures that we can measure subclinical anxiety and depression, which is really a measure of distress. Are people starting to feel really anxious or, or uh, moody before it even shows up at a stronger level? So scores below 18 on the uh, ISI are showing you subclinical anxiety and moodiness. It's there. And it could be from lots of different directions. If somebody has a thyroid disorder, half of that may only be from um, their physical problem, their T3, thyroid T3 deficit. And we know that drives the alpha up, diffuse alpha, and gives them slowed alpha. All the literature tells us that. But, um, you know, the other part may be that they got that thyroid problem because they were under so much distress. They had a really dysregulated gastrointestinal system, and they had a lot of inflammation, and um, eventually uh, their adrenals and their thyroid started to give out. So it may be a combination of the two. So you might always not be clear one or the other, but a combination of the two can be a consequence of that. Um, 
and here's a, an example. Here's the ISI, anxiety depression measures. Anxiety is quite high. You can see depression coming up. And this person was starting to get panic attacks even at 16. So that means when I see panic attacks at 16, um, I start to suspect that there's a strong physiological component too because I wouldn't expect panic attacks to hit till they were in their 20s. But here's that right frontal activation that we see in people with panic attacks quite often. Uh, and so throughout my oxidative stress, um, you can see here's uh, the value of the ISI, particularly the anxiety depression measures. Here's somebody with a lot of posterior beta. We always say, oh, they're ruminating a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, here's the alpha asymmetry of the same map. This is somebody who's ruminating, and so we have a lot of posterior asymmetries uh, in beta and posterior elevations, and a lot of alpha on the left, and there's your alpha asymmetry, and there's your depression. You can see that it correlates quite nicely. Um, Here's a gastrointestinal stress, really low alpha, excess beta. We look at the ISI, we can see, wow, there is not much psychological dimension to this. How come, where's all their stress going? Well, we look at the metabolic profile and we see, well, gallbladder and gastrointestinal are in 16 and 22 respectively. They're putting most of their stress into their gut. That's really common with most mammals, if you look at all of the stress research, most of them die from gastrointestinal lesions in the stress research. They don't die of anxiety and panic attacks. It's human beings that get into anxiety and panic attacks the most. Can you show that map from before then? Hmm? The previous slide, the map real quick? Yeah. Okay, so they get uh, alpha deficits, yep. Okay. Yeah, and um, this should be posted up on the internet too, this whole presentation. But I'm just using it um, as an example. So here's adrenal fatigue. Notice it's got a pretty strong correlation there, 0.719 between anxiety and adrenal symptoms. So you know that people who are anxious, it's going to drive their adrenals a lot. Um, and so anxiety, you expect adrenal problems. But when you get to... Um, uh, depression, and that's down here farther. Excuse me while I zip down to there we go. And thyroid, it's only a 0.57. Well, 20 to 30 percent of the population who are, that's depressed have a thyroid dysregulation. That's probably a conservative. 20 percent is probably a conservative measure, knowing how off the thyroid. T3, T4 measure. Most people are just looking, aren't even looking at T3, T4. Most of the docs are running just, you know, what's the general thyroid measure? Um, but the, the toxicologist will tell you that the criteria for a problem with thyroid is way off on most of the medical testing these days. It's well known. Um, and you look at thyroid, this ex explains, well, the reason it's only half there is because the other depression components probably came from childhood distress, and that eventually led to thyroid, which added the thyroid component. So the other half of the missing explanation of the variance here is probably the toxic stress in childhood. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and if there's any other quick questions, we're getting close to the end of the hour, but I think that um, helps give you a good... Um, review of the uh, of what the ISI is, the value of it, and um, how you might want to use it or look at it.